Welcome to Take Brain Stalk with your girl Flavella Fong Gang. And today I'm gonna fuel your brain with some bomb knowledge. Are you ready? Let's do it. Bonjour, welcome to Take Brain Stalk. This episode is not gonna be in French, but you are gonna hear the voice of two Frenchies. Yes, a lot of French accent today. And the title of this episode is How to Become a Lucky Tech Millionaire. I was lucky to come across, I said to come across, to have a conversation with Marc Defoss. And um, it was, it's so, it's so fantastic that I thought you need to be on the podcast. And I think everybody needs to hear about what you've done and all the accomplishments that you've um, had for yourself. And he's fantastic. So let me give you a bit of introduction in, in terms of who Marc Defoss is. So Marc Defoss, I'm going to pronounce the best French accent I can, Absolutely. is a founder <laughs> is a founder of Ribbon Fish, a technology company specialized in, in the publishing sector. He's in another French, as I mentioned, who made the UK his new home. You know, like me, I was meant to be here for one year and I've been here for 18 years. <laughs> and obviously, as I accomplished and I had an amazing career and, and I've done so many things as an entrepreneur. And, um, you know, the first time, you know, I heard his story, as I mentioned, I thought, wow, this man is lucky. And then I realized behind luck is actually there's a, there's a magic formula, there's an action that you take that, that actually helps you increase your luck. And Mark is going to be here to tell us his journey to become a tech millionaire. So Mark, comment ça va? Ça va bien, thank you very much, Flavilla. I'm absolutely fantastic, as always. You know, we need to, we need to be fantastic in those times, especially as everybody's Uh, you know, moaning about everything. No, I'm absolutely blooming marvelous. Before we start, can I just say just a, a very brief thing is, uh, and it's probably kind of relevant to that. So today is my dad's 89th birthday. Wow. Yeah. So it's, it's a great day to have a podcast. I think the stars are aligning. So I wanted to dedicate this podcast to him uh, and my parents in general, because a, a lot of the luck also came from them because I was rubbish at school. I didn't do anything. I didn't talk to a computer. My dad, when I was 15, uh, bought, he had an Apple to see at the time. And he says, this is the future of computing, my son. And I say, yeah, all right, whatever. You know, I was like uh, th doing other things. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he, put, he said, no, no, you need to learn that. And I said, yeah, well, whatever. So they pushed me through studies and I did, I did the studies I did thank to them because otherwise, uh, and, you know, no offense to anybody, I would be sweeping the streets literally because... I was so bad at school that, um, yeah, so a, a lot of luck comes from having good parents that have uh, that have pushed me through and always encouraged me. Uh, as you know, it's so amazing that you started this podcast like that because I think we quite often take our parents for granted. And the fact that you actually take the time to actually dedicate this podcast to him, I think, you know, that's a, that's a fantastic thing to do. So I'm going to say as well to Papa de Foss, bon anniversaire. Ah, very much <laughs> he, will, he will appreciate that. Fantastic. So tell us about your journey because I, you know, I love you know what you've accomplished you know for yourself and I think a lot of people find themselves into the entrepreneurial world you know by accident either they just had a terrible boss or if they realize you know well, this is where I need to go but you know your journey has been great as well so I'm kind of interested in terms if we start back in France you know how do you find yourself in France and then coming you know you were in France and then finding yourself in the UK should I say and so Up to 23, I would say I didn't talk to a computer. So it's quite funny that I have now a tech, a tech business, really. Um, and then I, I spend a lot of my time developing. I all of a sudden went from kind of, I wouldn't say zero to hero. Well, I was definitely at zero. The hero is for people to judge. But <laughs> So I, I started uh, liking developing and then I joined Accenture, which is a, a big five, which at the time was called Anderson Consulting. So I joined them in the French office. And so I, I, I kind of worked there for, for, for a little while. And then I had friends, very good friends of mine from university um, that had, you know, bombarded me for years of their dream of going to Australia. And, you know, they had go and they, they would be working in Australia. And that kind of annoyed me a little bit. And as I was in Accenture, I thought, well, you know what? I'm going to prove them that I can be in Australia before them. I mean, Australia sounded amazing. That was 2000. You know, the Olympics were going in Australia. So anyway, so... I asked Accenture without thinking that would ever work. I said, I would like to be transferred to the Sydney office. And I, if you can hear my accent now, like 20 years in living in, in English countries, you can imagine in 2000, that was fairly pathetic and my English was really bad. So I said, yeah, yeah, I want to be transferred. <laughs> well, and guess what? I managed to be transferred, which is quite amazing. So within two months, they came back and everybody told me over there, 
you cannot be transferred to the Australian office. Everybody wants to be in Sydney. I say, okay. And then within three months, uh, someone came and said, yeah, that's okay. You can, you can go to Australia. And, <laughs> and that was the Olympics. And I didn't know anybody in Australia. So I say, uh, can we, can we wait just for after the Olympics? Because I don't know anybody. I don't have a home. I, and there will be obviously the hotels will be a bit busy. So that's how I ended up in Sydney, a bit like a challenge to my friends that had annoyed me so much of talking about Australia and that it's a, an amazing country. So I arrived in Sydney and then I worked for Accenture for, for a little while over there. And then um, I wasn't too impressed with the way they treated me for the transfer from France to Australia because in Accenture, you have different grades because it's a big company. So if they ask you to go, they pay everything and there are four grades and that was the lowest, which was you have no skills, which was to be fair, not, not, not far from the truth. And you, you are the one to ask for the transfer. So you pay everything, you pay, you move, etc. But I say, okay. But then when I arrived in Australia, I was managing people that were, you know, I wouldn't say half my age, but that was at least five years younger than me and had supposedly the same level as I. And I was busy every day and every other person in my job or in my project with the same skills were all expat from Europe. So obviously I was a bit annoyed. So I moved to another company within probably three months of being in Sydney. I moved to another company, which at the time was quite big. It's a CRM vendor, which was called Onyx Software. And it's quite important because obviously a lot, a lot of what I've done and started with was thanks to them. So um, I joined Onyx Software and, and like the funny story of Onyx Software, if I have a bit of time is, I, so we were like in November in Australia. So this is the heat of summer. And I had an interview at eight in the morning. And in, in England or US, the, the lifts are secured. Yeah, in general, you always have like security on the lift. But in France, generally, we don't have that, do we? No, we don't. Mm. So I arrived for that interview at, uh, you know, at 10 to 8 or something like that. Um, call the lift, press the 14th floor on the lift, and the lift doesn't want to move. And I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, that was one of those buildings. There was no reception. Uh, all of the reception was in, the of, in their own office. So I said, that, that can't work. I have an interview at eight. There's no interphone. I can't buzz anyone. I, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the stairs. Oh, my God. Yeah, exactly. Oh, my God. So, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not completely stupid. So every floor, I would check if the kind of uh, the, the door to the, to the office on that floor was open. So I did that, you know, first floor. And I had a big... Big suit, my only suit that I brought from France, which was like a wool suit. So here I was in November in Australia with my wool suit and climbing up that stairs, you know, one stairs at a time, checking like it was open, arrive at the sevens, keep still open. And then eventually, you know, I was out of breath, so I, I stopped checking, arrive to the 14th floor, door locked. Oh, no. Then I went down, 13th floor, door locked. Oh, no. <laughs> went all the way to the seventh floor, which was the first or the last one I had checked, which was open. <laughs> arrived like you can imagine, I was like hot, sweaty, panting, and arrived. It like opened the door, like the, 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 the lady at the reception said, "Who are you? What are you doing?" I said, <gasps> "I'm trying to go to home software on the 14th floor." She said, "Oh yeah, yeah, the lifts are, are locked before eight, but that's fine after eight. <laughs> Oh my God, no one told you that. <laughs> nobody had told me that and nobody had given me a number. So I arrived obviously for the interview a bit late. The guy said, you're a bit late. I said, yes, yeah, sorry, I had to to walk like 14, 14 um, you know, lift of stairs and then go back down. So he laughed. So I got the job. So that was, you know, kind of, kind of uh, my, my, my lucky dip in that unlucky scenario was that he was feeling so sorry <laughs> for me sweating that he, he probably gave me more points in the beginning to, to recruit me. So, but talk about resilience, Mark, though. You know, you could have easily said, you know, well, forget that. I'm out. Out, bye. You stay. You went for this. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I, I generally fairly tenacious as a person. I don't like no as an answer or, you know, I can't do it. So if anything is a bit like with my friends in Australia, if, if there's a challenge on the horizon, I, I always love that. But yeah, yeah. So that's, I, you're absolutely correct. I didn't give up. I didn't say, well, tough luck. I will come back later. Um, did the interview, you got the job. Um, so I worked for, for Onyx Software for three years in Australia and they moved me to Brisbane, which is brilliant. I had one of the biggest clients over there. So I learned, I learned a lot. And I told you my first real job with them before going to Brisbane was with Sony Music. And I knew nothing. I mean, I, I knew absolutely nothing. You know, I thought I was kind of better by then in terms of developing and understanding software. And here I were at Sony Music knowing nothing. And trying to survive in that world and not looking too stupid. So for everybody out there that's listening to your podcast, you know, if you're feeling out of place, don't worry. Yeah. It 
get better. It can get better. You just have to, you know, ask people, try to look clever, ask questions, and and try to find your way in a project, even if you don't do what they have put you to do. So I was meant to be technical lead and I didn't understand anything. So I left the technical guys doing their technical stuff. And I was just talking to the guy at Sony Music, which was the, the kind of the IT director. And I was just designing stuff on a piece of paper. And I said, yeah, that's what you want. And I was like reporting to him every night. And in between, I was hiding in an office, <laughs> not knowing what to do. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, 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 it's what it is. Yeah. So that was Australia, um, three years over there, then came back, came back to England. And as you said earlier, I, I was here on a stopover to Barcelona 18 years ago or 17 years ago. So obviously, this, that was the longest stopover in the history of stopovers. And I'm not in Barcelona. I'm in Barnet, North London. And... When I arrived in England, I worked first for myself. So I was working for a guy I met in Australia, which is um, a French entrepreneur, and which probably gave me that sense of also being an entrepreneur. He was, we are talking about 2003, was already selling training online, uh, was already uh, using uh, marketing automation to try to convince, to build lists. He had his website. So I built a website where I was selling kind of day trading um, material. I, I was ads. There was quite a bit of traffic. I was, I was very well ranked back then. So I was paid by ads as well as doing some training online. So I did that for two years. And then a guy from Onyx Software called me and said, Oh, Mark, yeah, you remember me. I didn't remember the guy, but never mind. <laughs> He said, oh, yeah, 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 we work together. We were in Oxnick Software. I said, uh, yeah, whatever. Uh, he was not in Australia, but you know, he was in, in US and he knew of me. Yeah. And he said, I have, this, I have this contract in Islington Council if you're interested. I said, yeah, okay, that, that sounds good. So again, that was to do Onyx Software. I knew Onyx Software. So, so I guess, you know, one, one of my, my thing compared to others, is I was in a very niche market and there were very few people with that skill. So that's, though there wasn't that much demand, when there was demand, there was hardly anybody for, to fill that demand. So I was one of those people that had software experience and a lot of councils in UK. I think at some point they had seven councils in London that had Onyx software. So, wow. so they contacted me. I did some job for uh, Islington Council. Then the project manager there left to Ealing Council and he said, do you want to join me? I said, yeah, absolutely. I join you. So I went there. There was no job because they kind of had recruited all the contractors before having any job to do. So we were sitting there reading books. Wow. And then the guy from Onyx Software, the director of services of Sonic Software in UK, called me and said, I have this brilliant job in Basingstoke, you know, lovely place, Basingstoke. You are going to work harder longer and earn less. Are you interested? <laughs> and I said, yeah. <laughs> oh, and you know nothing about publishing either, but it's okay. And, and it's to create a database for managing books inside the CRM. I said, that's, that's not quite logical because CRM is for managing customers. He said, I know, but we sold them that dream and you are going to manage the project. They're like, oh yeah, great, 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 great. <laughs> and I, yeah, I jumped. I jumped because it was fun. And I was sick of doing nothing. So I don't like sitting on a, you know, uh, you know, a lot of people, if you, I mean, you, you know, that probably from, from people you, you have worked with, or, you know, when we go to France and you see people in the tube, we discussed that last time, a lot of people have no get up and go, and they are quite happy to have a job where they do nothing. Yeah. And um, I don't. I like doing something and I'd rather earn less, have an enjoyable job where I work my socks off rather than earning comfortably doing nothing sitting in, in, a, in, in that case in the council. So uh, I guess that's also probably different with other people. So, so then I went to Basingstoke. So that was for publisher Macmillan Publishers. And that's kind of how, how Ribbonfish started. Ribbonfish didn't start there. I was still a one-man band. But I delivered a project for them between 2006 and 2007. So we really created that kind of the management of all their books inside that CRM. And so it was great, actually, because they could, from a business point of view, they could see and, and their customers, which often are their authors, which often are their also their influencers. So they had all in one place, which was kind of a novel concept at the time. So we delivered that for them in 2006 to 2007. I did argue a little bit with Onyx Software because I was working my socks off. You know, it's probably seven in the morning to midnight one every day of the week. And the project had been badly sold. And I was trying to deliver the project and they were telling me, well, you don't give us reports. I'm like, 
I can give you reports and spend my life giving you reports and spending my week giving you reports. But the fact is, you have sold the project at a discounted rate. Yes. We, you have no resources available. You want us to mm. deliver. I am working for you on a daily rate and I'm not charging you by the hours and I'm working 13 hours a day or 15 or whatever. So we have two choices. Either I do your reports or you can stuff your reports and I deliver the project. Boom. Obviously, they didn't take it very well. <laughs> <laughs> it's a surprise. People have no sense of humor. The, the client loved me, obviously, and, 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 and our crew because we were working like crazy and they could see that we were late, but, you know, they could see we, do, we did our best efforts and they didn't really enjoy Onyx software because Onyx was like, well, we need more reports. Well, we need to cut down the scope. I say, well, you have agreed to something. You need to deliver what you have agreed, you know, as simple as that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Whatever it takes. So I did that 2006 to 2007. Then Onyx kind of kicked me out. They carried on the project. I worked for Carbon Trust for a year. And then in 2008, I had the disagreement at Carbon Trust as well. So don't take, don't, don't take it that I'm a completely unmanageable person. Maybe. <laughs> Some people might have said that in the past. Yeah, the IT director at Carbon Trust told me, well, you need, you need to back me up. Otherwise, you know, uh, your contract is at risk. And I said, I don't care about my contract. You know? if, you, if you're not happy with what I present. You are so funny. <laughs> this is such a French. And I, you know, but when I hear you, I think like, this is so me as well. We, I'm very much like, lately tell you exactly how I feel. And I think, you know, when we, we come to, you know, living in England where people are very subtle in terms of how they respond to, you know, to stupidity, it's very different how the French respond to stupidity. So very much, you know, it doesn't matter. I, I'm not going to do it for me. It doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, I think that's your, your right. That's our French education to first say no. And then after we might, we might come to a yes, but later on. <laughs> Well, if they're nice with us, if they're nice with us, we might we might agree to come back on our no and possibly do something nice. <laughs> you are you're absolutely correct there. I I I, I hadn't realized that as a friend, but yeah, you you're absolutely correct. That's a yeah. So obviously that didn't go down well, so they didn't renew my contract, and that was two thousand and eight. And obviously 2008 was, I hadn't realized before telling him to stuff his job that, uh, that was the Christ, the kind of Lehman Brothers crisis. So not a good, not a good time to be made, well, not made redundant, but have no contract. And, um, so I did my resume, tried to send my resume and mm -hmm. I couldn't find a job. I mean, seriously, I probably sent hundreds of resumes or hundreds of resumes seriously to people with, you know, like a accompanying uh, cover letter. I got nothing, not, not a single interview. I think I got one guy, one recruiter that contacted me and that's, that's it. So that was fairly miserable for three months. Um, and, and then I went back to the, to the client, to Macmillan Publishers from 2006. And I said, look, do you have any work? Doesn't matter how small or big, do you, you know, we did deliver your project a year ago. Do you have any bug to fix? You know, my, I, I can lower my rate. So Whatever, whatever, do you have anything? And the project manager over there, Alex, <coughs> say, oh yes, as a matter of fact, we have some minor enhancement to do to the software. We have a month and a half worth of work. Would you be interested at, uh, you know, the, the, the going rate in IT in general at, at the time was probably 600 pounds, 650, and that was 450. But I say, yeah, absolutely. So I went back there. So did my, did my stuff. One day she turned to me and she said, you know, your ex-employer Onyx, we are trying to, to use the same platform you've built for us and put it at another division inside Macmillan. And they have given us a quote of 300K. Would you mind checking it for us to see if it makes sense? Well, I say, yeah, 300K to be fair is a good price. So I said, let me have a look. So I, I had a very brief look on that day. That was kind of in the afternoon. And whilst the, 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 the full number of 300K makes sense, A, it was delivered with offshore resources, which are much cheaper. So I would have expected a lower price. And also, you know, they had itemized, they didn't know anything. So the itemization they had done was didn't really make sense in terms of number. So I woke up very early the next day and, and then I, I did, you know, she didn't ask me anything. I did a complete summary of what I thought they needed and how long every of those tasks came to. And I also quoted it. I said, well, you know, if we, if you were to make it in England with, with normal uh, UK contractors like me, 
that would, and funnily enough, and I did it properly. So it was not just to, to, to make a, you know, price discount or anything. I came up to pretty much the same price as, as my, uh, my previous employer. So 296,000 or something like that. And she said, Oh, that, thank you very much. That's very interesting. Three days later, she calls me and she says, hold on, oh. hold on. Yep. We're going to take a break and we're back in a second. 